A new agreement brings Ukraine closer to the EU. How will Russia react? Concern for the Holy Father's health. His planned visit with patients at a Rome hospital was suddenly canceled today. Cartoons and theology? Meet a Catholic cartoonist who makes that combination work. A NASCAR star and a world-renowned political icon visit the White House this week. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, June 27th, 2014. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. Looking at your news now, a major development tonight for Ukraine and its ties with the European Union. Wyatt Goolsby is here with the latest. Wyatt. Brian, the leaders of Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova signed a historic trade agreement today with the EU. And what that means is that these three countries with businesses that meet EU standards will now be able to trade freely with all member nations without tariffs or restrictions. In his speech today, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko asked the EU leaders to formally pledge that one day Ukraine be allowed to join the EU. And he said, quote, that would cost the European Union nothing, but would mean the world to my country. He also had this to say. This is the most important day for Ukrainian history after Independence Day. I'm absolutely sure that Ukrainian association agreement with the European Union is not just to finish our seven-year process, but the launch, the launch of the process for modernization of my country. Ukraine's actions today could be viewed as a snub to Russia, but one thing's for sure, it's a move toward greater reliance on Europe and a clear step away from their Russian neighbors. Russian President Vladimir Putin did not immediately comment on the trade pact, but has signaled that he wants to de-escalate the conflict with Ukraine. Meanwhile, one of Putin's presidential aides went as far as to call Ukrainian president a Nazi today. Sergei Glaziev, a senior advisor to Vladimir Putin, told the BBC in Moscow that the Ukrainian government was a clear Nazi government. Here's an excerpt from that interview. Are you saying that President Poroshenko is a Nazi? Of course, he, uh, he supported Nazi. He was in Maidan. For several, he uh, sponsored the so-called right uh, sector and so forth. And he, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk is a Nazi? Uh, of course. So, uh, uh, who is Nazi? It is not only those who proclaim Nazi slo slogans. Now, you heard him reference the right sector. That's a far right movement in Ukraine that played a big role in violent protests against former President Viktor Yanukovych. This senior Russian official also accused the Ukrainian president of being seen as illegitimate by a quarter of Ukrainians. He said there's no official recognition of the Ukrainian presidency in Moscow. So some pretty strong words, Brian, as there's clear, still clear tension there. Indeed. Thank you, Wyatt Goolsby. And now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Alan Holdren is at Rome's Gemelli Hospital. Pope Francis had planned to visit patients there. Alan, what happened to change the Pope's plans? Well, Brian, the Pope canceled at the last moment. We don't know exactly the reason yet, but the Vatican Press Office said that it was due to a sudden indisposition. This isn't the first time that we've heard this in recent weeks. He's also canceled some, some appointments that he had back at the Vatican, and uh, he also skipped a trip uh, about a month ago now uh, due to the fact that he wanted to rest up for his trip to the Holy Land. So uh, this isn't the first time it's happened. This is going to spark a lot of speculation, I think, Brian. So he had planned to visit patients there and bring some relics to the, the hospital, right? That's right. Today is the feast of the, the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And they've got a university here that's celebrating its 50th anniversary, which is also called Sacred Heart. The Pope was going to take inside the hospital, he was going to take two relics, one of John Paul II and another of John XXIII, and he was going to leave them there for the people. That chapel is also called Sacred Heart. This backdrop of Jubilee Hospital really is quite familiar to our viewers, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, the Popes have come here quite often, some for good reasons, some for, for health reasons. Uh, the last pope to come here was Benedict XVI in uh, 2011. He brought Christmas gifts to uh, children who were patients in the hospital. Um, also, you will probably recognize it uh, because this is where uh, Pope John Paul II spent his last days before uh, eventually dying there 
in the Apostolic Palace in the Vatican. He also came here uh, after the assassination attempt that nearly took his life in 1981. Also on another note, the Vatican has laicized a high-ranking Vatican official. What can you tell us about that? That's right. This is a former nuncio, an apostolic uh, diplomat to the, uh, the country of the Dominican Republic. He's a Pole. He's from Poland. Uh, he's an archbishop. And they've decided in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith that he will be laicized, which means that he will, be, uh, the, he will no longer be a priest. He can't present himself as such, and he can't celebrate the Mass. Uh, he has two months to appeal this ruling, just a canonical ruling at this point, and based on uh, whether or not that, that ruling stands, if it does stand, they'll go on to a penal um, a case, which would be a, a criminal case there in the Vatican. All right, Alan Holdren, our Rome correspondent. Alan, thank you so much, and we will keep Pope Francis in prayer. Hopefully this is just a, a, a minor setback for him, and we'll see him back in action. We appreciate you. Thank you. You're welcome. It is good to welcome back Dr. Melissa Muschella from the Catholic University of America. Dr. Muschella, the conviction of this Vatican diplomat is unprecedented. What do you make of his sentence? I think it shows that the church really takes sexual abuse seriously and is willing to really make a, a strong statement um, that it won't be tolerated. And, and I think that's really amazing. When, you know, People are criticizing the church about the way they've dealt with this issue, but I think it's really important to keep it in the context that in fact, uh, the church is the one institution that has done the most, you know, c in comparison with, say, public schools or other institutions where actually the uh, number of uh, sexual abuse um, allegations is, is much higher than, uh, than in the church. This archbishop still has legal uh, problems ahead in spite mm -hmm. of this ecclesial uh, sentence that he's received. Right. He's still going to be tried as a citizen of the Vatican and could receive a criminal penalty, including uh, jail time. So let's talk about the questionnaire results that were released by the Vatican this week ahead of the Synod of Families. Something we probably already knew that most Catholics don't, a majority of Catholics, don't agree with the church's teaching on sex and contraception. First of all, why this large disparity between what, what the church teaches and what Catholics practice? Well, I think it's just a matter of lack of good education. I mean, I think we could, we could wonder, when, when's the last time any one of us heard a homily dealing with any issue of sexual morality, let alone contraception? And so people are really being catechized by the mass media on this, and so it's no surprise that they don't understand the church's teaching and they find it restrictive or uh, it doesn't make any sense to them because they've never really heard the rationale for it, which is, in fact, beautiful and life-giving, and those who live according to the teaching find that it strengthens their marriages, it opens communication, they're so much happier for it that couples that don't use artificial contraception almost never get divorced. It's about 0.2 percent divorce rate. St. John Paul II's theology of the body is a great tool to understand why the church teaches what she does. But just the fact that this now has been officially brought out in the open, it will be discussed mm -hmm. at the Synod, that's probably a good thing for our church, isn't it? Oh, I think it's a wonderful thing that it's going to be out there in the public and that also that great effort has been made with the formation of you know, this generation of priests to get better education for the priests so that then they're more comfortable to talk about these things with couples and in the parishes and in the education that they give. So, you know, getting also more public education because of the attention to the synod is going to be fantastic. While we have you here, the Supreme Court this week did... Uh, issue a ruling that was a, a, a real win for the pro-life community. We are waiting on the big announcement, probably Monday, mm -hmm. on the HHS mandate challenge of Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you see that going and what do you hope comes out of that? I think based on what we've heard from the oral arguments that we have every reason to be optimistic about the outcome, but I just want to reiterate how important this case is. I mean, if the outcome is bad, if it's denied, that these corporations uh, have an exemption, ought to have an exemption from the HHS mandate. That basically means that an individual has no conscience rights in, in, in their place of business, that you have to kind of leave your conscience, you know, uh, on a rack outside the door before you enter the, the business world. And that's exactly what we don't want. We applaud corporations like CVS that make conscientious decisions to, for instance, keep tobacco products off their off their shelves. We should want more corporations to be acting conscientiously instead of just about profits. 
All right, and of course there are other lawsuits out there on behalf of EWTN and other religious mm -hmm. organizations that are not being ruled on right now, but we will be watching closely. We always appreciate your insight and your contribution. Dr. Melissa Muskella from Catholic University of America, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And the Sudanese woman sentenced to death for not giving up her Christian faith is now at the U.S. Embassy for her own safety. Miriam Ibrahim left a police station last night. She was detained there with her husband and two children. She was accused of forging travel documents. Now, relatives carried their luggage to the U.S. Embassy late last night. We're told diplomats are trying to arrange their departure from Sudan. It was an emotional meeting today in South Korea. The prime minister offered his condolences to the families of hundreds of high school students who died in a ferry disaster. It was the prime minister's first public engagement since resuming his post. He had offered to resign after the ferry sank in April. It's been 73 days since that tragedy, and 11 passengers are still unaccounted for. The U.S. has started flying armed drones over Baghdad to protect U.S. civilians and military forces in the Iraqi capital. A Pentagon official speaking anonymously says the flight started in the past 24 to 48 hours. He says these drones are support for reconnaissance flights the military has been sending over Iraq in recent weeks. The officials stress that President Barack Obama still has not authorized airstrikes against the Sunni militants. Those insurgents have been overrunning territory in other parts of Iraq. Iraq's top cleric is urging political factions to agree on the next prime minister. But the turmoil there is affecting thousands of Iraqis who have been forced to flee this violence. Tonight, we look at where they go with EWTN News Nightly's Catherine Zeltner. As Sunni militants continue their offensive against the Iraqi government, thousands of Iraqis are seeking refuge. Anna Mohammed Jamal and his family are among them. The 74-year-old carpenter and his wife and four children arrived at a refugee camp between Mosul and Erbil. He says they've been at the camp for seven days. They fled out of fear from the bombings of the Iraqi government and walked for 16 hours to reach another village. From there, they moved on to the Kayser checkpoint. Mattresses and cooking gear are being handed out to families at the camp. Conditions are tough, and Mohammed's family got an added blow when they heard other family members were killed in a bombing. Mohammed is not a government supporter, however. He's a Sunni, and he believes that ISIL will protect his family in the future. He wants an end to the Shi'i al-Maliki government and wants the revolutionaries to get power and free the area. Catherine Zeltner, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Catherine. As Nigeria holds out hope for the nearly 200 kidnapped girls, one local school is welcoming girls to rebuild their lives. The Tatali Free School welcomes young women from forced marriages who have since run away or have been thrown out of their homes. Only 2% of married girls in Nigeria attend school, compared with 69% of girls who aren't married. Uh, the girls that married at the early age, some of them are maltreated, beaten, without food, no dress, and the husband will be maltreating them. They now run because they cannot withstand that hunger. This school is supported by private donations. Georgia school leaders are turning down a new option of arming teachers. They argue that it wouldn't make kids any safer. The option is part of a law, effective July 1st, that expands where Georgians can legally carry guns. Georgia is among 14 states to propose a law in 2014 allowing teachers to carry guns. Nine more states passed similar laws after the mass school shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. Well, the White House plans to join an international treaty banning the use of anti-personnel landmines. The National Security Council says the U.S. is diligently pursuing solutions to join the Ottawa Convention. It bans the use, stockpiling, production, and transfer of the mines. The White House statement does not specify the size of U.S. stockpiles of these mines. Algeria football fans are celebrating their team's qualification into the knockout stages of the World Cup for the first time in history. Fans gathered Thursday in an outdoor square in the country's capital, Algiers, to watch the match on a big screen. The crowd erupted in celebration after Algeria's Islam Slimani headed home an equalizer to draw 1-1 against Russia in Group H. Algeria needed a single point to qualify for the next round. The North African nation faces Group C winners Germany on Monday.
Well, a colorful show of support as Team USA moves on to the knockout stage of the World Cup. New York's Empire State Building was illuminated in red, white, and blue lights in celebration. In spite of a 1-0 loss to Germany on Thursday, the U.S. team is still in the game. Portugal helped out with a 2-1 win over Ghana, which needed a victory to unseat America in round two. And we're all rooting for Team USA next Tuesday, July 1st. That's when they play Belgium. Coming up, remembering the poor in the service of human dignity, a theme for a Vatican conference, and an artist who connects cartoons with theology. As we keep Pope Francis in our prayers tonight from his official Twitter feed today, in the face of life's difficulties, let us ask the Lord for strength to remain joyful witnesses to our faith. Thanks for joining us this evening for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick, and serving the poor is clearly a priority for Pope Francis. He's been encouraging all of us to do so since his election. Well, it is the topic of an international conference at Vatican City this week. Putting the preferential option for the poor at the service of human dignity was the theme for this year's Dignitatis Humanae Institute. The group promotes the dignity of the human person. EWTN News Nightly caught up with some of the experts at the meeting. Prayer that isn't accompanied by action is a prayer that's far from reality because God uses us humans to be able to take action. This is the third conference for the group. It ends on Sunday. The Pope welcomed young astronomers from all over the world to the Vatican this week. The scientists from 23 different countries are taking a course on astrophysics organized by the Vatican Observatory School. Didn't know the Vatican has an observatory? It's one of the biggest and oldest astronomical research institutions in the world. The Pope said it's a place where young people from all over the world can engage in dialogue, helping one another in the search for truth. Well, who can resist a good cartoon or comic? Well, our Jason Calvi visits a Catholic artist who knows how to get people's attention, and once he has it, he can share an important message. So this was your most popular comic. It, I think it got about 500,000 mm -hmm. That's uh, what Facebook views. told me, yeah. Right. So do you ever do the voices for these guys? Uh, I mean, I can. I, I definitely have a voice in my head as I'm doing it. Hello, Luigi's Pizza Palace. This is Pope Francis. I'd like one large supreme pizza. Hold the anchovies. And the comic continues with a big game of telephone. Panel by panel, the Pope's real message gets changed. It's a critique of media distortion of papal statements. Everybody will stop when they see a comic come down on their news feed on Facebook and they'll, they'll want to read it. Um, and I think people don't expect to see any kind of like deep message in comics. And so um, I like to think that by doing what I do, I'm sort of catching people with their guard down and I can kind of slip them a message that they wouldn't otherwise be receptive to receive. Catholic cartoonist Jason Bach has enjoyed comics since he was a boy. He was raised evangelical Protestant. He converted to Catholicism a few years ago. I just have so much more fun now as a Catholic. Today, Jason envisions Pope Francis and Benedict rooting on their home countries in the World Cup. It was a priest friend that encouraged Jason to combine his faith and his art. I never know where the ideas come from. You've done some illustrations, very serious images right. of Our Lady and, and Our Lord, and, and you did this one uh, of Pope Francis. Right, yeah, I'm really happy with that one. Jason dreams of drawing full time. He's currently serving with the Franciscan Mission Service, but this work is also a service. One fan let him know that. She'd been going through a really tough period, and she really appreciated having something lighthearted and faith-affirming. You can find Box Cartoons on Facebook and online. Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, at age 90, he's ready to exit the world stage. We look back at this week's emotional state visit. Also, should NASCAR driver Jimmy Johnson have a permanent White House pass? Our White House wrap is next. Something new on EWTN News Nightly. Our White House rap, Laura Cole, has been at the White House for us all week. Laura, as veteran journalist, we've covered Shimon Perez for years. What was it like to be right there with him at the White House? I was five feet from him. What an amazing man, very soft-spoken. He's 90 years old. He looks great, 70 years, serving his country and his government. You know, and, and he came here. This is his final stop as president. And he met with President Obama. They discussed Iraq. And then he came out to talk with reporters. And he spoke on the subject, and he said, look, you know, 
Iraq needs to unify. But he also said that the internal conflict that's happening there is really an Arab one, not a Western one. Take a listen now and hear what he told us on Wednesday. I don't think it's for the West to decide who was the real heir of Muhammad, the Shiite position or the Sunni position. How interesting to hear an Israeli president say this is an Arab issue to decide who is the heir of Muhammad. Especially considering his background and now that he is leaving office, quite amazing. You know, the other interesting thing is it's been speculated and rumored that he's the reason that Pope Francis came to the Holy Land in May because he was and is leaving office. Mm -hmm. And what a historic time that was. E even more historic is Pope Francis being his charming self as he always is and then inviting him along with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas to come to the Vatican to pray together for peace. Those pictures are so telling and are so touching. It's a historic moment that none of us here will forget. I think there's a little more to, than charm to that. I think there's a little strategy as well. Also, there was a summit for families, the first at the White House this week. This is something that the president really says is important to him as a father. He sees the struggles and he wants to help change that. You know, part of what's really important to him, he says, is we've got to change things, including workplace flexibility. He also says there has to be paid family leave for new moms and also access to high-level child care. His intentions are good, and I think a lot of people would agree those are great ideas. The question becomes, how do you pay for it? That's what has to be figured out. And also on top of it, you know, we spoke with a Catholic mom this week who said, look, his policies don't really apply to me. She comes from a traditional family where it's two parents in the home, one goes off to work and the other works from home taking care of the children. And she says, look, I'd like to see something that would help give us some tax breaks so that we can benefit the fact that we're taking care of our children rather than just the single parents or the two parents that are working outside the home and they see that money, you know, going to health care, daycare centers, that type of thing. I thought it was interesting that she pointed out that she had to wait for her fourth child to actually be able to stay at home with the kids, which really illustrates what what families are facing these days. They can't afford it. That's yeah. why they're working. And so he really, if he wants to really energize the, the base in this aspect, he's got to find a way to do it with people like her. All right, I hear through the grapevine you are a NASCAR fan, and I'll bet you were really thrilled when Jimmy Johnson showed up. I was so excited. In fact, he walked right by me after he met with the president, and I said, are you coming to talk to us? And he said, yes, where do, where do I go? So he, um, you know, came over, talked with us. The president said, even cracked a joke, you've been here so many times, you really should just end up, you know, coming here, being a permanent visitor from here on out. So it was quite an exciting time. Well, I know that uh, if he gets that full-time pass at the White House, hopefully he'll let you use it. Thank you for the coverage this week, Laura. Thank you. Well, we celebrate... A very special milestone, EWTN News Nightly's 100th broadcast tonight. Thanks to a dedicated team of professionals and for the faithful support of our network and all of you who watch each weeknight here on EWTN, let's look back over these past few months. Well, that's our CEO, Michael Warsaw, accepting a Gabriel Award that we won. And we want to thank Wyatt Goolsby, who did that for us. We thank you for watching tonight. And we ask you, encourage you to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And of course, you can watch us anytime again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight. We hope you'll join us all next week. Good night. Have a great weekend. God bless you.